Today we're going to look at something called the fundamental counting principle. For the warm-up, let's review this counters game that we played a few days ago. Where should you place your game pieces to increase your chances of winning? Well, we talked about if you roll two die and you add them together, the most common number that should pop up is seven because there are um, more ways to get seven than any other sum. So if you put your counters on seven or near seven, it will increase your chances of winning. How about number two? If you flip a fair coin and get 10 heads in a row, are you more likely to get a tail on the next flip? And here the answer is no, you're not more likely. The reason is gambler's fallacy. And it's called gambler's fallacy because um, each flip of the coin is independent. It doesn't matter what happened before. So you're not more likely to get a tails even if you got 10 heads in a row. All right, let's take a look at some examples today. Um, again, we're looking at something called the fundamental counting principle. All right, first one, how many different outfits can be made with the following? Let's say we have one top, one bottom, and one shoe. Show the sample space and explain how you got your answer below. Okay, so for this one right here, we have a red shirt, RS. You could wear jeans, and you could wear your shoes, your Nike. So your red shirt, your jeans, and your Nike. You could also do your red shirt, your shorts, and your Nike, your Nike shoes. GS, green shirt. So we could do green shirt, jeans, Nike. You could do green shirt, uh, shorts, whoops, and Nike. And for your yellow, yellow shirt, jeans, Nikes, and yellow shirt, shorts, Nikes. All right, so there are six different outfits that you could get with three shirts, two pairs of bottoms, and shoes. Okay, another way that we could have done, there's several ways to do this. Uh, you could have also looked at multiplying three shirts, two bottoms, one pair of shoes, and you could get the same results. Okay, let's do another one. Show the sample space and determine how many possible outcomes there are for flipping a coin and rolling a die. Okay, so I'll make a table for this one. Let's say we have a heads and a tails. And we can get the numbers 1 through 6. Okay, so we can get heads and a 1, heads and a 2, heads and a 3, heads and a 4, heads and a 5, heads and a 6. You could get tails in a one, tails in a two, tails in a three, and so on. And so if we count all of those, there are 12 outcomes. Let's change colors. 12 different outcomes. Okay, another way that we could do it is we have two coins. We have six outcomes for the dice, which is 12. As well. Okay, next question. Find the probability, P is probability, that you flip a head and roll an even number. So I'm going to look at my table. Heads, even number, looks like 3 out of 12. We can reduce that as 1 fourth, of 1 fourth probability. We can write that as a decimal, 0.25, or as a percent, 25 percent chance of getting a heads and rolling an even number. So this thing that we've done it's called the fundamental counting principle. If there are A ways to make the first choice, B ways to make the second, C to make the third, then you can multiply those. A times B times C, and that will be the number of possible outcomes. Notice we could do it for this problem with a, a t coin in the die, 2 times 6, and we also did it for the outfits, 3 times 2 times 1. So you can multiply the independent events. All right, example three, how many three-course meals can you order at Bob Evans' restaurant? Here is the menu. So if we count the starters, it looks like there's seven starters, six entrees. Looks like there's six desserts. The fundamental counting principle says you multiply them all, and we have 252 different three-course meals. All right, let's look at a license plate problem. Kentucky license plates, I think they're made the same way as Minnesota ones where you have letters and numbers. 
Kentucky's Transportation Cabinet is doing a study to determine the number of unique license plates it can issue. If it can be helped, the Division of Motor Vehicle Licensing wants each letter and number to be distinct. No repeating. How many different license tags can be issued? Well, if you count the letters, there's 26. So you have 26 choices for the first letter. And if you use a letter, you have 25 choices for the next letter. And then if you use two letters, you have 24 for the third letter. And for your numbers, from 0 to 9, there are 10 digits. So we can multiply that by 10 for the first digit. Again, from 0 to 9, there's 10 numbers. And if you use one digit, there are 9 left for the second digit, and then 8 left for the third. So if you multiply those together, you will get, let's see, do this here, 11 million. 232,000 different license plates. Discussion question. Kentucky's population is about 4.4 million. On average, people get a new car every three years. The letters and numbers in the tags are distinct. How many years could the KT Kentucky issue tags until they run out? We could divide this by 4,400,000. Ends up being around 2.55. So they could do this 2.55 times. They do it every three years. So if we take that 2.55 times three, it would be about seven point something years. Let's do that here. Let's do it real quick. 2.55 times three. Okay, so for every three years, and it's about seven point six five. Okay, next one, what if the letters can repeat? So here, again, numbers and letters can repeat. Uh, so you'd have 26 choices for each of the first three letters. You would have 10 choices for each of the following three numbers. And if you multiply that out, it is 17 million. Let's write that better here. So 17 million. 576,000. All right. If you were employed by the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet, would you recommend they offer licenses with distinct, non-repeating, or repeating? So you can clearly see that if you can repeat letters and numbers that you are going to get way more possible license plates. Okay, last two examples. Let's say you have a PIN number, and it's a four-digit PIN number. How many different four-digit PIN numbers are possible? All right, well, I'm assuming that different means that you can't, you, can, you can't repeat. So we'll assume you cannot repeat a digit once you already have one. So that would give us 10 choices for the first, 9 choices for the second, 8, and 7 choices. So if we multiply that out, I guess 5,040, if repetition is not allowed. Okay, let's do the same thing for six digit. Again, we're assuming you can't repeat digits. So we have 10 choices for the first, nine for the second, eight, seven, six, five. If we multiply that out, again, assuming we can't repeat digits, 151,200 choices. What is the probability that you correctly guess a four digit PIN number on the first try? Again, assuming that repetition was not allowed, it's not very specific in this example. What would be the right one out of 5,040? That becomes 0.000198. Change it to a percent. 0.0198% that you could guess someone's four-digit PIN number if numbers didn't repeat on the first try. How many more times secures a six-digit PIN than a four-digit PIN? So if we take our 151200 divided by our 5,040, it ends up being 30 times more secure. How do we get that? Really, because we're multiplying it by 30 more here. Okay, how many different locker combinations are possible? Uh, again, I'm assuming that lockers, you can't use the same number twice. So if no repetition, okay, and usually combination locks have 
40 different numbers, and if you can't repeat, here's what it would look like, 40 times 39 times 38. If there is repetition allowed, and I don't know if there is with combination locks, it would be 40 times, it would be 40 to the third power. Just 40 to the third, you could type that in. All right, so you're gonna try this today. Again, the fundamental theorem is, if I could escape out of here, Okay, let's see if they're gonna let me escape here. Okay, so let me escape and I'll figure it out. All right, so that's it for today. Um, you can try the assignment. Remember, multiply your independent events.